in from um, New York City, actually, 6 a.m. here. Uh, excited for everyone that's tuning in from MUV Day in Amsterdam and online. Sorry that I couldn't be there in person as well. Um, I'm talking about MUV uh, across crypto in 2021. I tried to keep this anchored in what's happening on the ground in the real world across uh, the actual abstraction strategies that are being used, the negative effects or negative externalities that are caused by those extraction strategies, and then the efforts being taken to reduce those negative externalities. Um, so those are sort of the three broad categories that I'm looking at of MED activities uh, across crypto, extraction, externalities, and mitigation. And again, this is really focusing on what we've seen happen um, actually on chain in the last year. So we'll start this by looking at some numbers. Um, I tried to put together an estimate of how much MEV was extracted on ETH Layer 1 in 2021. So beginning with Flashbot's uh, public metrics, which is MEV Explore, about $475 million of MEV was extracted with just ARBs in liquidations in 2021. Um, so this number doesn't include sandwiches, it doesn't include uh, things like NFT MEV, some liquidations like Maker, uh, token siphoning, etc. So 475 million just from arbitrage and some liquidations. Um, there is a community sandwich profit estimate that builds off of some of the work MEV Explorer did, which was $379 million. If you put these two together, 475, 379, you get uh, about 850 million. Um, and that's a lower bound. But this doesn't include some really important categories that I've listed out in the bottom here, which I don't really, you know, don't have great numbers for, and this is just a finger in the air kind of estimate. So you can tweak them as you see fit, whether you think I'm over or underestimating here. But NFT, MEV, given the size of the markets, was probably somewhere around 100 million, 50, 50 million, 75 million, something like that. Maker liquidations, probably around that. Other kind of long tail things like liquidity sniping, maybe 50 million, something like that. So change sort of the last three categories like according to, to you know your intuitions as well. But um, if you just take the top two, that's 850 million. We're leaving some on the table, certainly. So the amount is somewhere between 900 million and a billion, I think, um, depending on your assumptions. And what this doesn't also look at is uh, centralized to decentralized exchange parts too, uh, and a bunch of other MEV categories. And of course, if layer one isn't the only market that matters anymore, and there are a bunch of other chains with a lot of MEV activity. So I went around, asked a bunch of different people in the community for their estimates on other chains, got uh, some good data, which is incomplete. A lot of these have data sources which are like halfway through the year. Um, so the Marlin Protocol team on their Explorer public dashboard estimated $43 million in R were captured on Polygon uh, in 2021. This is Jan 1st to December. BSC, the Eigenfi team, gave me June 1st to December 31st, $55 million. Uh, Will Sheehan gave me an estimate of $19 million on Avalanche from August to December, and zero X. Osaka uh, estimated $8 million in Solana arms. Um, so you add all that together, you get about $125, $126 million uh, in arms extracted over these ecosystems at the lower bound because of the time frames. So again, you know, depending on your assumptions here, you can you can go up much higher. Maybe you want to be a little bit more conservative, but, but the lower bound is about a billion dollars. And how are people actually capturing this? This value, you know, what are the strategies being used, and, and what are the effects from that? Um, that's what we'll dive into for the rest of the presentation. Uh, so, of course, we need to begin with priority guest auctions, where uh, the Flash Boys paper began this film. Um, so, priority guest auctions are this iterative game where bots are, bots are uh, competitively bidding each other up in an effort to receive priority at the top of the block by having the highest gas price, right? You send out a transaction, you watch to see that nobody else has a transaction at a higher gas price and you bid above them uh, if they do. And this was a game that really um, you know, competed on networking, latency, view of the mempool. But the externality of that was wasted block space. So 
Here's a block on Ethereum. It's an old one um, where one PGA bot, uh, one, one bot actually, one bot, bot, bot operator captured an ARB of $70,000, and then a bunch of PGA bots had uh, failed transactions after that. Um, so all of these 20 plus failed transactions don't end up doing anything. They waste block space. So uh, there's less supply of block space for regular users and ends up saving costs for everybody else. So in response to PGAs uh, and some other things, Splashbots released MevGeth. So this is our first mitigation uh, that we're talking about today. MevGeth created a sealed bid auction um, where you submitted your bids and they were um, adjudicated off-chain. So only the winner of the auction ended up landing on-chain and all of the losers had their bids discarded, put to the side. So you didn't have any wasted block space if you made a failed bid. Uh, and that's one important mitigation here. The other important mitigation was is that we um, mitigated the risk that miners enter into proprietary deals or develop their own MEV strategies instead of participating on an open market. So in Flashbots, any miner, small or large, can uh, listen to the system to produce the most profitable block. Um, and in such a way that is competitive with even the top uh, miners that run their, their own searchers. Um, so a small miner can make as much MEV as a large miner can uh, on Flashbots. And we mitigated that centralization risk. In turn, this created a new extraction strategy, which is Flashbots Auction, where you are uh, optimizing your code for gas price. So the Flashbots Auction uses gas price to decide who gets included on chain. And since MEV opportunities have a limited amount of MEV that you can extract, um, that is a numerator, that's held constant. The only thing that you can alter is your denominator, your gas used. Uh, so to get a higher gas price, you need to lower your gas used, um, which means that searchers are constantly trying to lower their gas used and make their MEV extraction as efficient as possible. And as a result, with less gas being used by MEV extraction, there's more space for users. You can see on this graph here, down to the right of the average percentage of total Ethereum block space that Flashbots bundles are using as searchers became more gas efficient over time. Uh, and the other important thing to, to note about this extraction strategy, the Flashbots auction, is that structurally common strategies are going to get bid off to the point where miners are being paid the majority of MEV um, to keep that property that small miners get as much MEV as large miners uh, would, or, or you know, any miner um, is able to get the most profitable block, rather. You know, lastly, um, because of the structural sort of paying most MV to miners, um, where there's competition, you're incentivized to find novel forms of alpha where there's less competition too. The externality of this was it became less risky to do sandwiches on Ethereum because you have atomic execution across multiple transactions. Um, so you can look at, at about January to May uh, as Flashbots adoption ramped up over time, sandwiches increased, but in May 2021, um, Uniswap V3 was launched and brought more capital efficiency uh, as well as a general downturn in the market and so sandwiches decreased. Um, also in the fall, we launched Flashbots Protect, which is our mitigation that gives users an easy way to uh, submit their transactions directly to miners. So you can do this by adding rpc.flashbots.net to your MetaMask. Um, all of your transactions then will be ferried directly to the miner if they're not seen through the public mempool. Um, you also don't lose any gas when you have a failed transaction. So add this to your wallet. We're gonna move away from ETH layer one and Flashbots and talk about some other extraction strategies, uh, which you know maybe get a little bit less traction on, on crypto Twitter, so this will be fun. A really interesting one that we started to see happen more um, or on chain this year is on chain search spam, uh, kind of a mouthful. But basically, if block space is super cheap and there are extremely fast blocks with first come first serve, then the dominant strategy is to just send transactions repeatedly, hoping that one of them uh, lands right behind an enemy extraction uh, creation opportunity, and do the searching for any of the on-chain instead of off-chain. So your, your program on Solana or your smart contract on ETH or whatever chain would actually be looking for ARBs uh, within that smart contract. Um, and you just hit the smart contract 
constantly, you know, thousands of times every hour, uh, trying to probabilistically land in a place where you would capture an arm and revert when you don't. Um, and you can do this because your reverts are so cheap um, that it's almost costless for you to constantly do this, uh, and you make a bunch of money when probabilistically you actually capture some MAD. Um, so you see on the right here, there's somebody that's, that's doing the strategy in Solana, uh, uh, you know, calculating ARBs on chain, they made $15,000 in one ARB drop. Uh, the negative, there's, there's a bunch of negative externalities here, but, but one of them was that um, Solana was being hit with so many transactions that validators didn't have the resources to um, process transactions of regular users. So you needed to be sending you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of transactions in the same way that liquidation bots were uh, to be able to get your transaction processed um, before there were some updates to how transactions were included that helped address this. But uh, the chain was down, uh, essentially down if you were, were a user and unable to stay in the network in the same way that liquidation bots were. Um, there are a bunch of chains that have some element of randomness to their block space market too. Uh, and if there is randomness in your block space market, then you are incentivized to spam um, to ensure that your transaction gets where you want it to go. So within Polygon, this has, has to do with network propagation and like which transactions go to the validator. Um, and the negative externality of that is spam. Uh, so you know, you, um, you can see here three different tweets of three different chains, BSC, uh, Aurora, and Polygon, um, where, uh, uh, you know, me in two cases and then Carnation in another are um, talking about people that are spamming huge amounts of transactions that end up wasting block space. They uh, lower the supply for other users, so it raises costs for, for other people. It adds a ton of load to the peer-to-peer -peer layer, so it becomes much more difficult to run a full node. Um, which is a cost that we don't talk about very much. And it loads the state space of your chain over time. Um, it also can bring uh, your chain down. So there's a case where um, there was a very hot token drop on Solana uh, to the point where a couple of bots sent huge amounts of transactions, hundreds of thousands, to get into this token drop as fast as possible. Uh, and it ended up bringing the chain down for a small period of time. Um, so pretty clear negative externality there, you know, your, your blockchain being brought totally down. Um, and the mitigation for this, as I understand it, is fee markets and some optimizations to how transactions are processed by block producers. Um, I think we have two more interaction strategies here, and I'll try to take questions um, on Avalanche before Snowman Plus Plus, the strategy was to maximize your stake weight and then gossip blocks as fast as possible. So by having as large as possible of a stake weight, you can hear about unconfirmed blocks really quickly. And by doing so, you can shoot off new blocks of your own as fast as possible. Uh, and so that was one like dimension of competition. And the other was running as many full nodes as you can um, to be able to gossip as many blocks as you can. Uh, and this meant that you had a ton of competing blocks happening on some N++, like increasing over time. Um, and since the consensus mechanism of Avalanche needs to process these competing blocks and come to some consensus on which one uh, is the, the canonical block, the final one that's included on chain, that meant that uh, over time, um, the time to finality on Avalanche was increasing pre some N++. So there was um, a bunch of changes that were made in some N++. I think they introduced a single leader uh, to mitigate this. There was also um, the externality that uh, uh, any, you know, uh, people running a ton of full nodes and running them, um, bringing them up really suddenly and uh, bringing uh, a ton of latency and load to the peer-to-peer -peer network. So um, there's this famous case where a single MEV bot launched thousands of full nodes at one time in like a space of 15 minutes. Uh, and so all of a sudden everyone's full nodes are, are syncing with this new party, they're sending them data. Uh, and it, it was such a strain on the network that I think the Avalanche team thought that they were being attacked when really it was just some party trying to capture some MEV. Uh, and that was indistinguishable from an attack at, at this case. And the reason why they did this was you could, um, prop, I, I think at least, you could propagate 
blocks with full nodes at that time and like gossip more of them so you had more of a chance of proposing the um, final block if you ran more full nodes. So like I said before, the mitigation to this was some N plus plus, changing how the consensus mechanism of Avalanche worked um, to make it uh, make the process uh, less conflictual. I think that there's actually a leader in this process now. Um, the last extraction strategy, latency optimization. You have a first come first serve chain uh, where you have fast block times, but you have medium to high fees. It doesn't make sense for you to spam on chain. Instead, it makes sense for you to get as close to the chain as possible uh, and try to be as fast as possible to land your transactions in the places that you want without incurring transaction fees um, that, uh, that um, would make it prohibitively expensive or, or unprofitable for you. So this makes all sorts of weird games happen. Uh, there's one full node that as of a few months ago, uh, one, one rollout that as of a few months ago didn't have a guide for how to run their full node, but searchers figured out how to do this. So there was an underground guide to running a full node for this uh, rollout that you passed around on Discord and it's like kind of a secretive thing uh, among searchers because it would help you, uh, I think, optimize for your latency. I know people who have launched hundreds, thousands of different AWS servers to try to find one that is the closest to the sequencer. Um, surprisingly, this, this isn't talked about that much, but uh, there's an Oracle team on first come first serve chain that runs their own liquidation bot. Uh, and so you post the Oracle update at the same time as the liquidation. And since it's first come first serve, since you're launching these from the same server, nobody else has an opportunity to even launch any liquidation transactions. So, um, the Oracle team wins all the liquidations, no surprise. And the externality of this is that um, you have block producer centralization. Also, we talked about this a few different talks ago. Um, so it's much more difficult to optimize for low latency than it is medium latency, right? So 13 seconds, 14 seconds on ETH, that's a fair amount of time for you to find and be optimized for a send a transaction. Something like 100 milliseconds is much less democratic. Um, the dominant strategy here is eventually to co-locate with validators or just become one. These kinds of deals are much more difficult to make transparent. It's not clear to me how you would democratize this too. And even if you could offer access to multiple people, how do you audit that you actually have equal access? So my intuition is, is that chains that have latency optimization as their dominant strategy trend towards block producer centralization. Um, and I would also question that this is really the kind of, of game that we want to incentivize. So, you know, we already have latency style wars in TradFi. Uh, we can build new, maybe more pro-social games with crypto. My thing, maybe spicy. Um, and there are a bunch of mitigations on the horizon too. So things that haven't been implemented now, but will be in 2022, hopefully, uh, or maybe early 2023. So Osmosis, so threshold encryption, we'll probably see fair sequencing services from Arbitrum, um, Shutter rolling out maybe on, on, on layer two and Flashbot style markets on other chains like, like Geo. So to summarize, uh, in 2021, we saw a, a professionalized class of MV extractors that captured um, and paid out to miners over a billion dollars as a lower bound in MEV. Um, protocol design was stressed under hugely adversarial conditions with a ton of money on the line. Uh, networks buckled under stress, even failed at times from MEV searchers, and we saw a bunch of uh, mitigations being implemented and pursued. So thanks for listening. That's my talk. I think I have a single minute for questions, uh, if anybody has any.